1956. A young man. He's a graduate of the Bellevue uh, Preacher Training School under uh, Bill Klein, or William S. Klein. He was, he's done mission work in Taiwan, uh, the Republic of China, and has served as an evangelist in local work in the states of Florida and Texas, Tennessee, and Virginia. He currently works now with the Newport News Congregation in Newport News, Virginia. He's authored uh, two tracts and numerous articles for Brotherhood Publications. Uh, he's also authored chapters of, for many different lecture books, lectureship books. Uh, he's currently married to Barbara Stan. I say currently. <laughs> that information is just good for tonight. <laughs> he's married to Barbara. Married to Barbara Stancliffe, they have uh, three children, Sean, Trevor, and Megan, who's here with us, and uh, two grandchildren. And I'm looking forward to see how he uses all these books over here. And so, uh, Brother Jesse, I think you're up here speaking next. I don't know how you're going to have any time left. He's got all these books up here. It'll be amazing to see how he gets through all this. Come on up, Brother Daniel, teach the truth to us. It is a distinct pleasure and honor to be with you on this occasion and to have part in this lectureship. We always have a great time being here with the good brethren at the Spring Congregation. We appreciate your sound and solid eldership, Brother David Brown. We love and appreciate him and his family and uh, your stand for the truth. Someone was asking about the uh, second pulpit up here, and I'm just trying to be balanced. <laughs> We've got brethren saying, you've got to be a balanced preacher, so I figure with two pulpits, I can preach a little truth, a little error, and that's balanced, because that's what some of them are doing in calling it balanced. The fact of the matter is, we're dealing with a very serious crisis in our brotherhood. And it is a crisis of truth. Truth is in the ballot. And truth is at stake. Pontius Pilate raised the question many years ago in John 18, verse 36, what is truth? Now, Pilate's question uh, really did not involve a serious interest in finding out what the truth was. I personally believe, based on the context and the situation in which he found himself, that it is more like a sigh of uh, desperation, born of the condition that he was faced with that he didn't know which side to come down on in the matter. On one hand, he knew that Jesus of Nazareth was an innocent man. And uh, Roman law would demand that he release him as an innocent man. But on the other side of the coin, there was political expediency. And the politically expedient thing to do was to turn him over, to condemn him as guilty despite his innocence and have him executed. And so Pilate actually chose the, a middle-of-the-road view. He declared him innocent and had him executed anyway. And uh, that reminds me of some of our brethren and the way they handle truth. They declare something a certain way, such as, well, I know that that's a sinful doctrine, I know that's a false doctrine, but I don't believe we ought to withdraw over it, that we should make it a test of fellowship. In fact, I had a couple of preachers told me that just a uh, little over a week ago, relative to the eldership R&R &R doctrine. We believe it's false doctrine, we believe it is sinful, and that you can lose your soul over it if you practice it, but we don't believe we should divide the brotherhood over it. You know, if I were a Christian church preacher, I would challenge these brethren to debate instrumental music. I'd challenge them, and then argue on the basis of eldership R&R. &R. 
And say, by the same reasoning, you're saying that you can fellowship those who teach and practice or who have taught and practice and not repented of this, you can also fellowship those who teach and practice instrumental music and worship. If not, why not? It all comes down to your attitude toward truth. And uh, Pontius Pilate was not really concerned about truth for truth's sake. He was concerned about not getting Caesar, particularly Tiberius Caesar, upset with him. But our God, Jehovah God, is a God of truth. Deuteronomy 32, verse 4. And his law is a law of truth. Psalm 119, verse 142. The primary dictionary definition of truth is conformity to fact or actuality. Yet there's much dispute over the nature of reality, and thus just what is fact and what is actuality. We have folks who are saying that reality is just your perception, that it is just what your mind conceives of. And we're dealing with this type of thing today in our dominant culture. The entire philosophical systems that we are currently confronting deny that reality even exists separate and apart from the human mind. And that life is, as the old song goes, row, row, row your boat, life is but a dream. Especially, this is true, among all of those systems that are based on existential philosophy, which has captured the hearts and minds of millions worldwide who seek to escape from the reality of life by denying its very existence. In looking at this particular subject, we need to consider the historical background of the situation. By the way, read the book, read the manuscript. I can't cover everything in the manuscript as well as deal with this material as, uh, in the course of our study. But we need to recognize that out of the Enlightenment, there was a cult of reason developed. In fact, uh, the age of enlightenment, as, uh, or the age of reason, as it was referred to by Thomas Paine, uh, glorified human genius and human rationality. The enlightenment was a movement whose roots went back to the Renaissance in Europe, but it found fuller expression in the post-Reformation period as a reaction to the rise of Protestantism and the Roman Catholic Counter-Reformation. The collapse of Roman Catholic control of many of the uh, nations of Europe, particularly in Germany, freed these so-called free thinkers up to do what they pleased. They uh, felt they had no reprisals that could be brought against them, and to a certain extent that was the case, and they just went hog-wild and pig-crazy. Such men as Thomas Hobbes, David Hume, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and this is the most influential one, Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, and then, of course, the notorious Voltaire. All of these men and many others sought to move Europe toward a religion of humanism, a religion that pushed man to the uh, pinnacle of things, and uh, this rise of rationalism that would solve all problems, that would uh, settle all questions and answer all problems, all situations, would be found in human reason. Really what they did was went back to the philosophies of Socrates, Plato, Epictetus, especially in his humanism, Epicurus, and his hedonism, and uh, their principal successors, and brought those things forward to justify their own behavior. In fact, the basic nature of philosophy, and philosophy is simply a worldview. Everyone, in, to a certain extent, is a philosopher. He holds a worldview. But philosophy as a system, as especially as these men sought to make it, existed for the sake of justifying their own behavior, justifying their own actions, their own thoughts. 
They believed that the universe would finally come to be understood in its completeness and in its complexity by their superior intellects. And uh, so they were going to establish a utopian situation, particularly in Europe, that would spread then throughout the world. Oddly enough, the supposedly religious theological centers of Germany, France, and also of England and America were infected with this rationalism as well. And thus we had men such as Friedrich Schleiermacher, as was mentioned earlier in the lecture today, as well as F.C. Bauer and uh, Strauss and Renan and others who stepped forward with their liberal criticism of the Bible, some of it historical criticism with a warped view of history, some of it uh, redaction theory or redaction criticism and other forms of criticism that they began to attack the Bible. They hated the Bible. And one of the common things among all of these various philosophers is that they were either agnostics or outright atheists. This was a common thing. And like with all atheists, they held two things in common. If you have never noticed or ever uh, examined atheism carefully, you'll find that atheists hold two basic points in common. Number one, they deny God exists. And they will call you a fool for believing in God. And then the rest of the time they spend their time being mad at God for his existence. If he doesn't exist, why get angry with him? That's like getting mad at the tooth fairy. But that's what happens. And that's what they did. Well, rationalism really didn't settle much. The more the world leaned towards skepticism and humanism, the more violent it became. World Wars I and II, followed by a long, bitter Cold War, were splashes of waters of reality to the human race. Nazism, communism, other uh, oppressive systems, political expressions of the uh, Enlightenment mindset brought suffering and death to multiplied millions. The result was a reactionary uh, process that came about that led to the cult of unreason. It was counter-enlightenment. It elevated irrationality, and it calls itself postmodernism, after modernism. And so in connection with these events and other expressions of reality, a rebellion against human reason began. As early as the 19th century, its roots are traceable in the writings of the earliest of the existential philosophers, but by the 20th century it was in full bloom. In fact, they based much of what uh, they had to say, or mo much of postmodernistic philosophy, is based on the writings of Hegel, who himself was a rationalist. But what they did, they took Hegel's ideas and just twisted it and used it for their own purposes. What they took was the idea of the dialectic, that you have a thesis that develops an antithesis or an antithesis, and then in their conflict with one another, a synthesis is created that in turn becomes another thesis that then raises up another antithesis that in turn becomes a synthesis as a result of the conflict. And this is an ongoing process. The communists took it, uh, particularly socialism under Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels, uh, and others like that ran with that uh, as part of their views. But the postmodernists thought, well, we can handle this better. And in some respects, they tried to combine it with religious and mystical belief. Such men as Soren Kierkegaard was one of the uh, most prominent in this regard, uh, respect. Immanuel Kant, even though he was a rationalist, at times lean toward mystical views of things. Finally, the most influential philosophers of the movement were Jean-Paul Sartre, Albert Camus, Martin Heidegger, who himself was a Nazi and uh, remained a Nazi even after the fall of Nazism in Germany. Jacques Derrida, Stanley Fish, Hans Georg Gadamer, Gerhard Eberling. These men became the leading philosophers of the movement. 
And it is this view of things, this view of reality, of this view of truth, this basic philosophical system that has become the dominant system today. This rebellion was more of a co-opting than a true repudiation of much of the Enlightenment's cherished theories and ideals, despite what postmodernists say. Postmodernists will rail and yell and scream, and if you read the books, including books up here, they'll talk about, oh, we, we've gotten away from the modern mindset. Hogwash. They have simply tied it in with other ideas, despite the contradiction. Thus, the current state of the intellectual community of the world at large is a sea of ferment. Competing philosophical systems have spilled over into theology, politics, science, and even daily living. You have mysticism of various forms. You have postmodern philosophy itself. Still, a lot of rationalists out there. In fact, I even refer in my manuscript to... Uh, a Professor Harris, who is a professor at William and Mary, who wrote a very good book attacking postmodernism, but he admits himself he, he holds to certain forms of relativism. He is a rationalist, and uh, he is upset with them. James W. Sire has captured much of this irrationality that is summarizing it in an excellent book entitled, Why Should Anyone Believe Anything at All? He also wrote a book, a companion, actually an earlier volume, now in, I believe, the fourth edition, The Universe Next Door. He, in the discussion, he asked why people, or deals with why people believe what they believe. He details some of the epistemological bases for the various belief systems. Under the heading of postmodern psychological reasons, he notes two key things that were given by students in response to surveys he had put out in, in some universities. The first is, one should believe only what one wants to believe. Now think about that. One student said, I think people have a right to believe whatever they want, be it there is a God or not. Well, what's the problem with that? That would sound so great in a democratic society. We just believe what we want to believe. Got news for you. God's not going out of business simply because you refuse to believe in him. He still is going to hold you to account. Another said, I think people should believe what they like. Observe the fact that these young people held that one's belief system should be shaped not by the facts of the case, but rather by one's personal feeling. The second thing given by Sire even more so draws out the irrationality involved in postmodernism. It is the belief that, quote, one should believe in order for anything to exist, including the believer, unquote. In other words, if you don't believe in anything, you don't really, you're not really there. You don't exist. Here are some quotes he gave, gives from students. If I don't believe anything, then I basically don't exist. That was at Oberlin College, 1991. Again, anything wouldn't be anything if no one believed in it. You can get this one. If you don't believe in anything, nothing will be. That was at Illinois Wesleyan, 1992. And then this one, this is my favorite. If I cease to believe in existence, I will cease to exist. And we wonder why our educational system is in a mess. In postmodern philosophy, virtually everything then is a construct of the mind, whether individually or corporately. Reality is itself but a construct of the mind. Therefore, our realities can and do differ, according to the postmodernists, so that perception is reality. Have you ever heard somebody say that? Brethren, I've heard that said by members of the Lord's Church. Perception is reality. Again, that's nonsense. It's reminiscent of the story of the young man who was being audited on his federal income tax. He had uh, actually failed to file a tax return for several years despite having taxable income. In the course of the audit, the auditor asked him why he had not filed his taxes. And the young man said, well, when I was in college, I was taught 
That reality is how I perceive it. I simply didn't perceive that to be all that important. To which the auditor responded, well, when you're sitting in your cell in federal prison, then just perceive yourself to be somewhere else. <laughs> that would take care of it. Postmodernism then becomes the philosophy of the absurd. In turn, this has had consequences for religious belief. And brethren, it has affected even members of the body of Christ. Philosophers have been leading theologians around by their noses for ages. I have heard Brother Thomas Warren make that statement on numerous occasions. And such is indeed the case. New Ageism, Process Theology, the Emerging Church Movement, and that's what these books are about, Cultism, Occultism, Liberation Theology, and all other forms of, of wacky and weird stuff that has come out of various schools of thought that have no real foundation in the Christian faith have been thrown out and justified, or at least attempts have been made to justify it, on the basis of the absurdities of postmodernism. In short, these people reason by not reasoning. And they do not mind inconsistencies and self-contradictions in their teachings. In fact, they speak of these as mysteries. These are mysteries to ponder, challenges to faith, which is itself redefined as assumption, the acceptance of something as true without adequate evidence. In fact, many of this crowd assert loudly that we cannot know truth and should not even expect to do so. We are only to act as though we do. Thus, these problems they consider to be illusory. This has led some, in fact, uh, this idea has been around some time among Brotherhood periodicals. Back uh, many years ago, one brother in Mission Messenger compared truth to a hot dog or wiener that's tied to a dog's tail. The dog can smell the wiener, even catch a faint glimpse of it from time to time, but he can never attain it. He just runs around in circles chasing that wiener, which is always just a little bit out of his reach. He can never know that it is really there. He thinks his senses tell him something is there I want but he can never partake of it. Thus man is said to be constantly searching for truth. In fact, they even say that it is the search of truth that's important. It's not getting the truth. Jesus said, Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. John 8, verse 32. Jesus' idea of truth was vastly different than that of the postmodern. He believed that truth was knowable, and not only was it knowable, it was absolutely essential for one to be free from the tyranny of sin. Now, in dealing with this matter of the knowability of truth, and I don't want to preach, uh, I've already dealt, stepped on some of uh, Brother Gary uh, Summers' material. He's going to be, I've already been looking at it, some great material on postmodernism. And I'm not wanting to deal with the with this matter of can we know truth uh, too much because that gets into Ken Chumley's area. But I am going to steal a little bit of their thunder. In the matter of this knowability, brethren, we've got some folks who are saying that it is impossible to know truth. They are part of the emerging church, and they involve even members of the body of Christ. A very prominent member by the name of Fred Petros has written four books. In fact, I have those books. And this is one way I'm going to take care of these books, Brother Jack, is simply point out these four, Missio Dei, Tradition, Opinion, and Truth, A Pixel in a Greater Picture, and A Mobile Church for Epic, E-P-I-C, with periods behind the letters, time, moving across faith community borders. These are manuals, as it were. They, in fact, he described them somewhat as uh, patterns for establishing uh, emerging church, emerging churches or congregations. It's amazing. These folks denounce our referring to the New Testament as a pattern, but they will write man-made patterns and say, that's good. We need to go by this. This is something we need to hold on to. 
What it comes down to is they do not like God. They do not like God's Word. They do not like the truth. And they, got, they have to get rid of it to get, to get you away. Brother, Brother G.K. Wallace used to say this. In order to get man away from God, the devil knows he's got to get you away from the Bible first. That's where it starts. And that's what these people are all about. And one of the men is Fred Petros. And involved with, with uh, this particular doctrine is uh, a man by the name of Al Maxey who likes to rail against patterns, does so frequently on his defections website. He calls it reflections. I call it defects. It's full of defects, and on top of that, it causes people to defect from the truth. False doctrine. But Brother Maxey, in his material, uh, claimed that he didn't know anything about this emerging church business, and yet he has endorsed the writings of Fred Petros, who claims these are for the emerging church. Which leads us to wonder, does Brother Maxey go around endorsing books that he doesn't really know what the books are about? Doesn't know what, they're, what the emerging church is all about? Yet he endorses the books that are for it. Fascinating with these folks. In a book entitled, An Emergent Manifesto of Hope, this again is a compilation of articles by various men, the chapters including Brian McLaren, uh, Dan uh, Kimball and all of these, Barry Taylor, and uh, this particular article is by Dwight Friesen that uh, is designed to be, again, to set up a pattern as to how to be an emergent church. And he says, here is my working maxim of a theology of orthoparadoxy. Now, this is what he is advocating as the type of theological system we need to put in place. Then in italics, he has for emphasis, the more irreconcilable various theological positions appear to be, the closer we are to experiencing truth. Did you get that? What he is saying is, the more we're able to tolerate all these divergent views and ideas and, uh, that are self-contradictory and contradictory with one another, and so, the more we put these in our, in our theological bagpipe and blow on it and just take it in and, and, and accept all of these, that's when we're experiencing truth or we're closer to experiencing truth. Notice. doesn't say we're actually experiencing truth. We're closer to experiencing He goes on to say, Ortho-paradox theology is less concerned with creating once-for-all doctrinal statements or dogmatic claims and is more interested in holding, watch this, competing truth claims in right tension. It is nearly, if not entirely impossible, for anyone to embrace rightly another person who holds the claims that compete with his own which is precisely why the development of a robust theology of holding difference, paradox, and otherness is so essential. Who said so? Where does he get the authority for that? He says he asserts the most important things to hold to one another. Who said so? Where's the authority for it? His own feelings. If all truth is just his perception... If all truth is just subject to what he thinks and what he feels and so, why is his feeling any more important than yours? Any, you know, if everything is based on one's claim, then any claim is as good as any other. I could just as easily assert, you know, that the most important thing is let's kill two-thirds of the population and take what they got. For the third that takes the two-thirds of the population what they have, they might think that's a pretty good idea. That's how monsters are born. That's how Adolf Hitlers are created. That's how Mao Zedongs operate. And how Joseph Stalin's wipe out entire races or tries to. 
this idea that everything is relative to my own personal feelings, and now we're going to institutionalize it in the form of a theology. And so as to get God's blessing for it, ostensibly. Now watch this, they're going to blame the Holy Spirit for it. Ortho-paradox theology requires a dynamic understanding of the Holy Spirit. Where are we hearing stuff like this from, folks? There's a little place in Denton, Texas, where there's a fellow that's teaching that you've got to receive enlightenment from the Spirit so you can really understand God's will better. And now his son has gone off into this movement. And it's no wonder. Without the reconciling presence of the Holy Spirit actively drawing together those who would naturally divide, there is no possibility, watch it, no possibility for humanity to experience the kind of oneness that Jesus enjoys with the Father. It's impossible. Have you noticed something? And this is a little aside. Liberal brethren, including such folks as Al Max and so on, they, they like to write about how the church was back in the 40s and the early 50s and so on. And they say, what we're trying to do is restore the church back to the way it was in the 40s. What is implied in that? What are they admitting, but they're not wanting to admit? That there was a time that unity existed while they're saying right now, it's impossible to have unity. Why? If it existed then, but it can't exist now, what's the difference? It's not in the matter of the truth. It's not in the matter of the Bible or the Word of God. It has to do with the attitudes of the people. And it's the same attitude that we see in Jeremiah 6, 16, when the people said, we will not walk therein. That's the difference. Look for the old path. Seek. Stand in the way and, and, and seek. But they said, we will not walk therein. That's the difference in attitude. And that's why it is impossible. Not because the standard is flawed. Not because the Bible is wrong. Not because the Word of God cannot make us one if we are willing to obey it from the heart. In fact, Philippians 3.16 shows we can be united. If we will be in agreement, Amos 3.3, it is possible to be united. The problem is with the hearts of these folks, of those individuals like the Petros, like Al Maxi and Ruba Shelley and others who simply will not abide by a thus saith the Lord. That's what it comes down to. But here's another writer. And this man has been called, in fact, Fred Petros calls him the guru of the emerging church. And he is a staff writer, or at least he is a featured writer, along with Tony Campolo, on uh, the Wineskins website, Wineskins magazine. If you go to their website and take a look at all their writers, you'll find Tony Campolo, Fred Petros, and uh, this man, Brian McLaren. And Brian McLaren, by the way, has recently made the rounds at, at uh, ACU and DLU, spreading his uh, era to those campuses. Now, listen to what he says concerning faith. Faith is a state of relative certainty. This is in the book, A Search for What Makes Sense. Relative certainty. As we will see in the next chapter, we humans don't seem to have the luxury of absolute, unquestioned certainty in many, and then he has in parenthesis, if any areas of life, and especially in matters of the spiritual life. You know, they say it's impossible to be certain. I wonder if he knows where he lives. Does he have an address he goes to every night? Or does he have to have someone lead him home? Does he know he is Brian McClare? Do they know who they are? Are they certain that they are who they claim to be? When they get their paycheck, and it is made out. Is it their name that's on that paycheck? And are they certain it is their paycheck? If not, why don't they just put my name on it? I'll be certain. If they can't be certain, I'll be certain about it. 
But that's where we are with these folks. Then he goes on to say, faith is a state of relative certainty about matters of ultimate concern. We are not talking about abstract mathematical equations or the middle name. I wonder if he, he believes that 2 plus 2 is 4 in base 10. And by the way, there's a difference between numbers and numerals, folks. I made the point on occasion that, uh, you know, there are two ways of knowing things. In fact, we deal with that in the lecture. You have empirical evidence that involves the five senses. You also have intuitive evidence or evidence that can be brought into existence or can be discerned by inductive, deductive reasoning. You can know things intuitively. And mathematics is one area where that exists, where you can demonstrate it. And uh, I'd made the point that uh, 2 plus 2 is 4, base 10. And someone said, but you've got, you can write that down and show that to be the case. The process itself, the idea exists up here. When you write it down on paper, that's a numeral, and all you are doing is providing a symbol for the idea. Mathematics is essentially a mental function. But they think somehow they can get around that by saying, well, I can write it down, I can demonstrate it on paper. Well, yes, you can demonstrate it, but you can know it to be the case without having to write it down. Anyway, this is his position, that faith is not certain. You cannot really know anything. Then here's another statement uh, from the very same man in which he talks about, get this, we need to be given to a limited relativism. I am not recommending that we affirm absolute relativism. <laughs> what? That is reminiscent of the nonsense F. Lagarde Smith put out in his book, Who is My Brother, when he said the truth, we have to combine a little bit of objective truth with subjective truth. By definition, truth is objective. There's no such thing as subjective truth, folks. Somebody needs to go back and, well, I don't know what they need. More than I can give them. Which is logically an absurdity. But rather honest, limited relativism. Well, what is that? Well, it's whatever I don't know. That's what's relative. I mean, that's, that's it. That, I mean, that's what it comes down to with these guys. Here's another one, Brian McLaren again. And by the way, in this one, it's Adventures in Missing the Point. It's Brian McLaren, Tony Campolo. And Campolo was Bill Clinton's advisor, spiritual advisor. Boy, did he fail miserably. But he, and he's advertised on the Wineskins website as Bill Clinton's spiritual advisor. And these brethren seem to be proud of that. He says, I also struggle with Tony's assertion that human beings are infinitely more precious to God than all the rest of nature. Get that? Human beings are not infinitely more valuable than the rest of nature. And when you read some of the stuff he writes on environmentalism, you'll see why. He is a white elephant. He also writes, there's no such thing as absolute truth. In fact, he says, we need to become a new kind of post-objective, intersubjective Christian in several ways, and then details that. Another book. This is by Tony Jones. And, and brethren, if you read everything these fellows write, I guarantee you, there's one thing that'll happen. If you have low blood pressure, <laughs> this will cure it. This will cure it. He says, in the aftermath of the myth of objectivity, of fideisms and airtight systems, we're left to embrace our subjectivity to revel in it. For it's only when we accept our own biases that we allow them to be shaped by contrary opinions and biases. It's no wonder that this man with this kind of view and some other statements, in fact, he even refers to objectivity as being as real as a unicorn. That's what he said. I wonder if he is objectively right on that. Is he right? How would he know he's right? 
It's fascinating that these men, concerning their postmodernism, they say we can't really understand what the Bible meant in the first century. We can only read it through our 21st century eyes and apply it to our own culture. We really can't know what they are. In, and so we've got to view it with, with uh, a sort of a jaundiced view. We can't help it. We're caught in this prison house of language. But it's amazing. They think that their stuff can be easily understood. They don't apply their same laws that they apply to the Bible to their own writing. This man, by the way, Tony Jones, has now come out in defense of homosexual marriage. There are other statements I could read from uh, Brian McLaren where he says concerning Buddhists, they don't really need to become followers of Jesus Christ. They can remain Buddhists and be followers of Jesus. They don't have to become Christian. And God will save them anyway. There are two books, I'm closing on this point, two books that have recently come out Two Quakers, Gully and Mulholland, who are identified with, at least uh, in various sources, with the emerging church movement. One of them is entitled, If Grace is True, and then it is subtitled, uh, Why God Will Save Everyone. Brethren, that's where this move is, if movement is headed, universalism. Everybody's going to be saved, including practicing homosexuals. We're in a crisis, and it's time we woke up. Thank you. It's hard to follow some of those quotes. <clears throat> that is settling this going to be. Well, Brother Daniel, I'm impressed. Uh, impressed with all those European and German names you pronounced at the beginning. I would have still been up here tongue-tied. We appreciate the good lesson. Certainly, uh, this, these are the kind of people we're having to deal with today. <clears throat> but I always remember something that Brother Brown that said a long time ago, you, uh, uh, you can't reason with an unreasonable person. And these are unreasonable people. And I don't know what you're, how you're going to argue with them because they don't even believe, uh, they don't believe that uh, something, you can know something or something exists. How do they even know you're standing there in front of them and arguing with them? Or they're even there arguing with you. So, uh, again, it's just filling this golden seed. We are, uh, have about seven, eight minutes, and then we will...